Welcome to another edition of the Sim Racing Garage. I'm Barry Rowland. In this episode, we'll be revisiting a pedal set that I reviewed back in April of 2021, the SimForge Mark I. The guys at SimForge have been very busy redesigning the electronic controller board package to increase overall pedal resolution and resistance to EMI affecting the pedal's performance, also making some tweaks to other parts. Time to put them through the SRG's review process and see how they do. So, let's get to it. So let's see what the guys at SimForge have been up to since I published the original review on this Mark I pedal set. First off, I'm not going to be doing any adjustment videos or any of that stuff in detail because all that was done in the original SRG video as it went through our process. Everything like the adjustability is still here as it was before, like every single hole in these pedal faces is able to take these flathead screws because they're all countersunk and you can move this thing all over the place along with, of course, the throttle and the clutch over here. So you should be able to get these things positioned anywhere you want and be comfortable with it. That's just an example of the adjustability of the pedals that they build into these things. So very adjustable. Again, go back to the other review and look for the details there. Now, let's talk about some of the changes here. First, we'll go over hardware change, which is kind of two things they've done differently here, but some of it also applies to the electronics performance. First off, you'll see these white bushings in here for the stacks or for the retainers for the springs. They are 3D printed units. Not sure if that's PTEG or if it's regular PLA, but they have files now available for these bushings. So if they wear out, all you have to do is download their STL file and run that through your favorite slicer and print them to yourself. So if you wear it out, there you go. You can replace it quite easily. Put a little lube on it, put them back in and you're good to go. And you can see on the brake pedal, we also have the changes there. So these little white bushings are easy to see. That's where the changes are. Everything else is the same, except this is where the hardware slash electronics comes into play here. Now the clutch and the throttle both have hall sensor setups in them, just like in the other review, they haven't changed anything there, but they have changed the way that the hall sensor is working. You can see the hall sensor down in here, and that's the circuit board. So you see this hall sensor's up towards the front there, a little chip in there. And you can see it on the bottom, but we can't see the chip. We see a couple of resistors. So before we had the magnet up here on this top piece, see up there. If I can get it around sideways, you can see it. There we go. Now you can see the magnet sitting in there. And this is a 3D printed arm, also available in an STL file from the guys in India if you need it. Now, there's a magnet there, obviously, that plays on the hall sensor down there. And the magnetic field increases as the magnet gets closer to it. And that translates into signaling that we transfer over to the PC and, of course, the game. And that's how we make things move. Now, the resolution on this has gone up, and that's in the electronics package. Now we're running 16-bit. They've done something a little differently. The first time I've seen this, on the bottom here, they have another magnet. Let's see if I can get this to close so we can see it. There it is. I don't know how well you're going to see the magnet, but uh, and do my hand at the same time. Let me try it this way. <laughs> All right. So there we go. So see the magnet there? You can see the side of it poking out over there. So now we have a magnet on the bottom too. And you can see it through there. So now we have two magnetic fields, two magnets, as we push this down. So we have the one on the top is getting closer at the same time the one on the bottom is getting further away. And this gives us, according to the guys over at SimForge, a more precise way to measure the magnetic field with our Hall sensor. So the Hall sensor can actually pick up the bottom magnet through the circuit board itself underneath here. So it picks up the magnetic field through that. So that's supposed to make it more accurate. And then we have the 16-bit resolution on both the throttle and the clutch, where before we had 12-bit. So that should give us more resolution. I did have a complaint about the throttle pedal in the first review. And that was I really had to stretch my angle out to get all that travel out of the pedal to get the resolution that I wanted. And it was kind of hard on my ankle. So now, with 16-bit resolution, we have more steps to work with. 
I should be able to shorten that throw and not sacrifice the modulation that I'm able to do on corner exits. So we'll see if that pans out once we get back into the car and are using them. So that's about it as far as the hardware differences. So that's it <laughs> on the pedals themselves. And other than that, the pedals are exactly like they were before. Now, the brake pedal has the main connector here that's going from the load cell. And we're going to be attaching that to our circuit board that controls everything. Look the controller electronic package over here. Now, I'm going to go to a different segment to go over the electronics package. And this is it here. I've taken the cover off. And we'll talk about the different way they've gone about doing this. The theme here is to do what they can to mitigate EMI or RFI interference with our electronics that are coming from these electric motors. And this is a very important thing to me. I mentioned in a lot of videos that manufacturers need to start taking more care and pay more attention to this issue because more and more people are now in the market to where the market has come down on price points for direct drive wheels, which are servo motors, and they obviously emit EMI. Electric motors do that. They're good, very good at it, actually. And it can interfere with your electronics. End of the day. Even just a single servo motor on a direct drive force feedback wheel can play havoc with a load cell or some other circuitry in your shifter, whatever the case may be. Maybe even in your button plate where the circuit board is there or whatever you're using inside of your button plate. These things can be affected, and the results are like ghost shifting, all kinds of weird things can go on. So they've taken it on themselves, SimForge, to try to mitigate that the best they can. And we're going to go over in detail on how they decided to approach that. So let's take a look at the new, improved circuit board. <laughs> so first off, this board's main purpose is to help mitigate the EMI interference that we get from electric motors. And that can be anything from a motion system to a direct drive force feedback wheel. It can be a fan system that you're running fans on your rig. And I have, as an extreme example of that, I have a 60 OF system. And with that and my direct drive wheel and the fans I'm running, I have no less than 10 separate electric motors running at different RPMs when I'm actually racing. So as you might imagine, that has a very good potential to screw around with the electronics because all the EMI that's bouncing around, and it's not just airborne, it's through the cables itself, the power cables. There's a lot of places for it to happen. And even in the circuit loops, the ground loops and circuits can cause it too. There's a lot of potential for that. So what they're trying to do here is give you some filtering options and also increase the I guess the, the best way to put it as resilience against EMI. And also they're updating the 12-bit to 16-bit on the throttle and clutch. And we'll talk about that board first. Here's the blue one. This is an ADS-1115. Get a look at it there. We get a focus. There we go. So this is a 16-bit analog to digital converter. And this is what we're using for our clutch and our throttle now. And of course, they the throttle and clutch signaling goes in here, it gets amplified and converted, and then it's sent down to our main processor board that's sitting in here. So that's straight up, straight up that way. And now this processor board is a PIC18F2550. And it's running at 48 megahertz. So that's the chip that they're running in here. Now let me get you a good look at that. Let's see how good I can focus. There we go. Next, we're going to look at this HX711 24-bit load cell analog to digital conversion board. Turn it around here. Now, this is kind of a cool board. Most of the time in a load cell circuit, on a set of pedals, we see the load cell signaling going to an analog amplifier board because the signaling is so sensitive that you need to step up the signal Amplify it, in other words, give it some gain so that the processor can handle it properly. And then we send it over to the processor or whatever board that's going to do the actual analog to digital conversion. And that works. But having less parts in your circuits or components in an electronic circuit is always a good thing because every part in an electronic circuit 
has its own signature, if you will, on that circuit. So when we can eliminate pieces, it usually means the circuit's going to run cleaner, which also helps reject EMI, right? So this is a cool chip because what it does, it takes the analog in from the load cell and it amplifies it and converts it in the same chip. So internally in here, we're stepping up the analog signal to the required gain so that we can convert it to DC and it's a readable signal and it's a resilient signal when it's sent down to our processor chip down here. So that eliminates an analog amplification circuit being separate somewhere on the board. Kind of clever. I like the way they did that. I think most manufacturers should pay attention to that when it comes to load cells on their brake pedals. Now, that's the boards. I don't think there's any other board I want to talk about. We talked about that chip. Now let's talk about how we get power to the board. Of course, we have two interfaces here. You can see we have the USB-B, which is 5 volts, and then we have another DC input here. We also have a switch over here. And that switch will have some labeling on it. You can see one of it, one side looks like a USB symbol and the other is a little electrical signal, meaning voltage. So let's say I'm using a PC in the USB port or maybe even a powered USB port, whatever the case may be. And I'm getting some noise on my pedals, doesn't matter which one at this point. So there can be interference or noise coming from the actual PC interface or powered hub interface that's causing some of that. So how do we get rid of it? Well, we simply take that current or that voltage off of this. We just shut it down, right? And then we'll go ahead and plug in an independent power supply over here, DC power supply. 9 volt, 1 amp is recommended. I'm actually running a 12 volt, 2 amp with no issues because really the internal regulator, the power regulator system in here or the circuit in here will take care of all that. So in other words, this board's only going to pull as much current as it needs to use. So just because you have two amps doesn't mean it's going to pull two amps. It's only going to pull what it's going to pull based on our power regulator system. Speaking of which, we've got a KA7805 voltage regulator transistor sitting up here. You can see the heat sink sticking up from it. Well, you can see that in there, but it's kind of dark. So, that can give you an independent power supply that you can plug into a power strip that's coming off your electrical outlet. And as long as that is on the same circuit in your house, in other words, you're not plugging things into one circuit or uh, like a 15 amp circuit, then another 15 amp circuit in your box, then you don't have, you won't have any ground loops or noise returning through the ground through those two circuits. So another good thing to help mitigate EMI is to plug in all of your electric motors into the same circuit in your house wiring. That way, it can only go to the ground that's outside your house. So, in other words, if we had another signal coming in another circuit, that was also loading it, dumping itself on the same ground that's in your, your electrical box in your house, it can actually get noise feed or loop back to the other circuit. So, always try to do that if it's possible. Now, what else we want to talk about here? The filtering itself. All right, so we've got these jumpers here on the side. That's right way up, yeah. And we have two sets of them. We have a set of four down here, and we have a set of six up here. And you can see on the top, it says breaker. What does that say? Filter. Okay, it says break on the bottom. Okay, that's, that's the way you tell which one's which. It says break on the bottom here. And then we, on the top here, it says filter because that's what this bank of jumpers does. So this four on the bottom is for the brake. These up here are for your clutch and throttle. So what's this, the idea behind this is, this is different levels of filtering. So the pinouts on the bottom here are actually connected on traces that are going back to our processor over here. And that has different levels of filtering available inside that processor. So we're changing the jumpers. Instead of using a piece of software and doing it, which you could probably do too, we're just using physical jumpers here. So if I have noise on my brake pedal, and we're going to check this out. I'm going to pull DI view up. Even though I don't have a bunch of motors running around it, usually there's some kind of movement there. So we can change these jumpers on the filters and see what effect that has. And I might even try doing USB first and then put a, the power supply on here, the 2 amp power supply, 12 volt, and see if that changes anything either. 
on the most sensitive settings. So right now, we're on zero filtering on both of these settings. You can have a zero down here, and I have a zero up there on that the bank starting there. So I think from the factory, they ship these things on like three or four. And this one's probably maybe on two or three. I'm not sure. But again, once you understand what they're for, you can back off these filter pins if you want and see where you can go and not get any movement in DI view and your, your raw signal coming from the actual controllers. Kind of cool. So that's what we're going to do. Again, very simple. Just pull the jumper off here and pull it off the clutch. And there we go. Just like any other jumper you see in PCs and things like that. No big deal here. It's the same stuff. And then I would move it to, let's say, the third or second one. Doesn't really matter in this case because I'm not really changing anything. Oops, took another wrong one. Put it up here. Okay. So now I'm in number two. Or is that number one? One, zero, that's two, I think. All right, so there is two. So that would change the filtering or amount of filtering that I'm getting through the chip in here. And that would alleviate any shaking or jerkiness you get in the signal when you're viewing the raw data in an application like DI View. So I think that's it for showing you what's going on with this circuit board. Again, I like what they've done here. They've eliminated a separate analog amplifier circuit and integrated it into one 24-bit chip here. And also, of course, the analog to digital conversion is happening in that same chip. Again, that's usually going to be less noise and less susceptible to picking up noise from outside forces. So what we'll do next is I'm going to go ahead and plug the pedals in, get everything set up, and then we'll come back. We'll have DI view up, and we'll make some changes. We'll see what the stock, what happens at the stock settings. And again, I'm not in a hostile environment right now. I'm going to be checking this again. I won't be showing you probably, but I'll be checking again, but I'll let you know if I had to move my filtering once I'm in the very hostile environment of my motion rig, once it's up and running and we're actually racing in it. So yeah, we'll get to that segment next. I have a little test set up to test the circuit board to see its functionality. It's not very scientific. You know, it's on the bench and we've got these sensors to where I could be pressing at different pressures with just my hand. It's, obviously, I'm not a robot. I can't get exactly right both times or every time, and it can't be consistent. But it should give us enough information on how this board is functioning as far as filtering. Now, right now, I have the USB plug plugged in, and I have DI view up. I have the raw values up. Over here, we can see that the top one is the clutch, the middle one's the throttle, the bottom is the brake. Brake's not moving. Solid as a rock. But you can see we've got a little bit of motion here in the clutch and the throttle. Now, this is probably internal circuit noise on the board itself because this is not a very hostile environment. It will be a hostile environment when it comes to EF, my RFI interference once I get my motion sim fired up and I have this attached over there and along with a direct drive force feedback motor and with some fans if I'm running that too, all of those can emit interference. So what we're going to do here is first thing, remember on this board we have alternative power supply too. So if I'm getting noise from my PC, the motherboard, or a powered hub for that matter, then I can switch over to an external power that's going on a power strip and see if that makes any difference. Now, it may not here because I really don't have much interference going on. But what I'm going to do is go ahead and unplug my USB plug. Everything stops. And I'm going to go over here and switch my switch to external power. And we're going to use this plug, which is 9 volts, 1 amp. Regular DC plug, little wall ward over there. I'll switch that over. And I will plug the power in and see if that made any difference. Okay, so it's still moving. Maybe not as much as it was before, but it's not enough really to make a difference, I think. So I'm just going to say that's really not making a difference in this particular environment. So nothing's going on there. So next we'll try the filtering. I'll go ahead and pull this off. Pull my USB out. Make sure there's nothing going anywhere. Put it back on USB. And then we'll have the 5 volts from our PC again. Put this in. See if we can get our noise back. Sometimes this takes a, yeah, there, it takes a couple of seconds or even a minute for it to come back up on DI view. So now we're still moving like we were before. Like I said, I don't think there's any difference when we had the power plugged in. 
But what I want to do here real quick is find out what I have on resolution when I don't have any filtering over here on these jumpers. Remember, we got four positions for our brake, which is running at 24-bit for the filtering. We have six positions for the clutch and the throttle, which are running in a 16-bit circuit. So let's go ahead and do that. What I'm going to do is pull the calculator up and see how many steps I've got here currently. All right. So I'm going to press the throttle all the way down. It's the easiest one to press. And this is just relative. Again, I'm like, I cannot press this exactly consistently every time with my arm. I'm a human being. I can't do that. So it's looking like 21.9, jumping around a little bit. Seems to be jumping around a little bit more now that I did this, which makes sense because I'm going max resolution here and I'm engaging more signaling in the circuit. 21.9.8, hasn't gone down. Yeah, there's a seven. I'm going to go 21.9.70. Let's do that. 21.9.70. And then we're going to subtract where it is sitting in neutral. And I'm looking at 49, 60, 59. It's back and forth between 60 and 59. So we'll use 49, 59. 49, 59. 17,000 points or steps. So yeah, that's pretty good. It's a 16-bit board. So we're looking at 17,000. But again, this is not really what is going to be the true resolution. I mean, that can vary with circuit design and everything else. You can put a 16 board on something or 16-bit board rather on something or in a circuit. And if your circuit's not efficient, then it can be anything from like, uh, what, like 14-bit to 15-bit to 16-bit. It depends on circuit design and, and what's going on. So I would say this is a good indicator, though, to show how many steps are available to us. And I'm surprised to see 17, to be quite honest. Now, what we're going to do next is we're going to try a filter. And to do that, I am going to, actually, let's remember this number. Let me grab that real quick. Put it on a notepad. I think I got one open down here for some stuff. Yep. So we'll go ahead and paste that in. And we'll come back and make sure we didn't forget it. So I'm going to clear that out. And I'm going to put that down here. So what I'm going to do is unplug the USB again. And then I'm going to move the jumper from 0 to 1 on the throttle clutch filter bank. Go ahead. And, oops. USB first. You want to unpower it just for safety. You want power going to the board when you're doing stuff. So sometimes weird things can happen. Okay, we're on filter one now. I'm going to put the USB back in. And let's see if we can get it to reinitialize. I know the connections came loose. Well, the filtering might be working so we can't see anything, but... No, nope, not yet. Again, this is a, a little bit of... <laughs> hurry up and wait when it comes to this stuff sometimes. So now I'm not getting anything back. Sometimes DI view, let me activate another window. This has trouble reestablishing the connection. Go ahead and pull it out and push it back in again. Well, work with me. There we go. Now it's going. So let's see. First off, we can see it's not moving anymore. We're at 49.50. We're at 47.99 and we have no fluctuation at all that didn't move did it no, i don't think it moved okay so on just one on the filtering which remember we have up to five on the filtering which is six different positions we don't have any any more shaking going on which is nice of course it wasn't that much to begin with but it's working apparently so what we're going to do now is i want to see if it affects now that we know the filter works how does it affect the resolution? Does it decrease it? Does it increase it? I would think it would decrease it because we're clipping off some of the wave or the fil filtering. That's what it does. Clips off some of the wave so that it smooths things out. So I'm going to go ahead and see what we have for resolution. And this is only one. I'm, it might affect it more if I go all the way up to five. And we might test that too if there's nothing going on here. Let me bring my calculator back up. And it's already cleared out. So I'll go ahead and push my throttle again. 22027, very steady this time. So 22027, we'll use that. 027, and we'll subtract our 4978 where it's sitting. That comes out to 17049. What do we have before? 11. <laughs> so we've actually got a little bit more, although it's not that much. I mean, it's it, 17,000. The difference is not really something you would be able to tell in use, I'm sure. But yeah, 
It didn't change though. So one last test is to, let's go ahead and clear this out. Let's go ahead and put the max filtering I can on this. I'm gonna go ahead and pull my USB out again. I'm gonna take the jumper off. I'm gonna put it on number five this time. All the way, that's the most filtering you can get on the clutch and throttle circuit running at 16 bit. Plug it back in. See if we can get some motion out of this thing. Hopefully it doesn't take as long. There we go. I fast forwarded through that because it actually took about 30 seconds for DIV to pick that back up. And I reseated the USB, checked, make sure the connections were tight. Interesting. Anyway, so we're back with full filtering. So let's go ahead and see what we have now as far as our steps. So this time I'm going to push it down again. This is not scientific, but it'll give us close to, to see what's going on at least. So now we're at 2211 down here on the throttle. So we'll use that 2211 011. And whoops, that's too many ones. And we're going to subtract, sitting steady at 4890 currently. 4890. Wow. <laughs> well, this is not making a lot of intuitive sense to me, but there it is. It's actually even more than it was before. So now we're at 17,121. So really what the point is here is that even with the maximum filtering applied to the 16-bit circuit, it's not affecting the resolution. So that is very good. I like to see that. So that means, you know, this is a good design. I mean, whoever designed the circuit board over at SimForge did a very good job on this, I think. And I, I like the fact that they did go to greater lengths to try to build something that's more resilient and resistant to EMI interference. Again, like I said in the closer look, manufacturers just aren't doing this and they need to start paying attention to it, I think. All right, so that's my quick test. Now I'm just going to get everything set up I'm going to drive it and make some comments about it then. And I'll tell you, tell you about the, if anything changed or made any big difference uh, as far as the EMI interference. I'm sure it will once I'm over there as far as DIV goes. But yeah, we'll also see if we're getting 24 bits out of the brake pedal. I can't push the brake pedal far enough now to get that number because it's on the bench. But once it's securely mounted, I'll be able to push it and get the full resolution out of it. So now we'll go ahead and get all this kit mounted to the rig. So I have the pedal securely mounted to my pedal tray now. Go around the side here. I did have to rearrange the profiles on my custom pedal tray to make it fit right. But no big deal. We've got it braced up pretty good here. And I do like the way they've changed the design here on this electronics board holder, these two pieces of plexiglass. Now I can get my screws in there, T-nuts, as you can see. Securely fastened, so it's not going to go anywhere. Better than, I think before I had to Velcro it on or something. The last, if I remember right on the review that I did originally on this pedal set. Anyway, we're all set up now. And what we'll do is go ahead and get in and do some driving. We're in iRacing at Sebring in a Ferrari 488 GT3. And let's talk about the throttle. Running a new 16-bit board versus the old 12-bit. There's more resolution available to us. And it shows in the amount of travel I have to use to be able to control the car successfully. Before, I had to extend the stop on the throttle all the way to the back, which overextended my ankle a bit when I was using it to use up all the resolution that was there. And it still felt just a little bit like I vague-ish as far as exactly trying to control the car. And I'm happy to say that the new 16-bit board that they're updating here is a different feel altogether. It's more finite and it shows especially through turn 17 here where we're carrying a lot of speed through this turn ton of bumps in here a lot of g-force trying to slide us to the outside of the turn and yeah you really got to be able to tippy toe through that with a good throttle pedal you can do that now with this before i could do it but it was more of a muscle memory thing more than a you feel like you're actually controlling the car by the inputs you're putting in the actual throttle so Hats off for that. That's a definite improvement, at least for me. Other people might not be able to feel that. But yeah, it's something that's a very fine little piece there that's missing from the other throttle on the 12-bit board or any throttle on the 12-bit board. It's not going to have the feel that you get out of something that's running off of 16 bits. So I kind of expected this to happen. And yeah, happy with it. I was able to negotiate turns and have a lot more confidence controlling the car 
versus the old throttle pedal. Now let's talk a bit about the brake pedal. Now remember, this is an 80 kilogram load cell in this. I'm used to like a 200 kilogram, so I did have to adjust a little bit because I'm bottoming it out. <laughs> so um, as far as capacity goes, but being 24 bit, it does help. So the first thing I did have to adjust a little bit to the lighter feel, but once I got past that, I was able to adjust to where I felt like I was controlling the car in the most critical part of our braking, at least to me. And that is as we're ending our threshold braking and starting the transition to the trail braking to take some weight back off the front tires so we can initiate turn into a corner. That's a very important piece there. And it's very hard to get a pedal, a brake pedal to feel like you're actually controlling the car under that area. And it feels better with this 24 bit board than it did with the older board that they were running. It just feels like I have a little bit more control in that, or I feel like I'm controlling the car instead of just using muscle memory every time. And that's a, a key thing. It's not as good as some of the other pedal sets that I have or the pedal set that I run every day, but you know, we also have to maintain expectations here at the price point of what's going on with this brake set. So considering that it's only $488 shipped to the North America, it's a pretty good buy for a set of pedals constructed this way and deliver the performance they are now delivering. And the EMI interference is gone. I ended up using the number one filter on the throttle clutch bank where we have the little jumper that we can put on there. And I used that and I didn't have to touch the brake. And then with my motion system on, you can see it's on now. There was no hopping around or anything with the controls. This is kind of amazing me because it doesn't even have a metal shielding around the, the electronics board. So hats off to the circuit design that they've done here. They've really done a good job. And I think that, um, yeah, <laughs> they've definitely made an improvement to the pedal set as far as overall performance. Final thoughts on the new updates that SimForge has implemented on their Mark I pedal set. It's good to see Sim Racing gear manufacturers making improvements on their existing designs and components. Here we see SimForge has been working to make the Mark I pedal set even better, starting with the new dual magnet hall sensor setup. I spoke with the guys about this design, 
and they said it was changed to improve the accuracy of the movement for the throttle and clutch. As the sensor chip they are using is able to register decreasing and increasing magnetic fields simultaneously. So, why not use this as an advantage in signal accuracy? The clutch, brake, and throttle pedals are also using a newly designed 3D printed bushing set on the springs and bumpers. The STL files are available for download so you can print your own if you wear them out. The most labor intensive update has been to their circuit board design and components. The clutch and throttle pedals are now being controlled by a 16-bit board, with the brake pedal being updated to a 24-bit controller board. This board is unique in that it does analog signal amplification and analog to digital conversion of the load cell signal all on one chip. This allows the elimination of the separate analog amplifier board used in most designs I've seen to date from other pedal set makers. There's also a set of jumpers on this new board for the clutch and throttle, another set of jumpers for the brake circuit. They provide filtering for each circuit to help mitigate EMI noise interference with those circuits. I really like this feature and would like to see more pedal makers take the time to implement something similar in their systems. When driving basically the same pedals with updated electronics, the familiar Mark I feel was there with a sense of increased accuracy on the pedal's response. I found a noticeable improvement to the throttle's feel during touchy modulation situations. This without having to overextend my ankle like I did before. The brake pedal also felt more sensitive than before, requiring me to adjust my pedal pressure from what I had previously used, but this in a good way. Overall, I think it's easy to see SimForge has been hard at work trying to make their pedals better, and it shows in the results. At around $488 shipped for the pedal set with a base plate, it certainly is a good alternative to other pedal sets out there today. Thanks again for watching The Sim Racing Garage. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button. And if you would like to help support what I do here at the SRG, visit my website at simracinggarage.com.